Good morning, everybody. As always, thank you for joining today. I uh, hope everybody is enjoying, enjoying the beginning of spring this week. Uh, and uh, we'll just give it, as always, a moment for people to join. I want to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Salas. And as I've been mentioning a lot this month and honoring Women's History Month, Dr. Salas, and especially Dr. Harmon, have both been really instrumental in helping set up uh, our presenters. Uh, Dr. Salas will be introducing uh, our presenter today. We're really excited about. And thanks again, Dr. Salas, to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Zalga, and it's a pleasure to be with everyone uh, this morning. Um, before we get to today's speaker, just wanted to foreshadow a few upcoming uh, talks. So these are our upcoming grand rounds. Next week, we have Dr. Adriana Hung, um, who is a, a nephrologist at Vanderbilt, who's joining us. And then the following week, April 6th, we have Dr. Meredith Craven and Dr. Linda Wynn. Um, both uh, from gastroenterology and hepatology. And then April 13th, we have Dr. Sherry Weiser and Dr. Ariana Teherani. Um, so stay tuned for all of those excellent uh, upcoming grand rounds. And um, before I introduce today's speaker, I also wanted to share one more event with folks, which is actually happening today. It's the annual community health symposium. Um, it's 20th annual actually, and um, starts today at 4 p.m. I'm putting the link for registration for that. Um, in the chat. So if folks are interested and available, um, it would be great to, to have people join that event. Um, and with that, we'll go on to introducing today's speaker, which um, I'm very excited about. Um, Dr. Jacqueline Antonovich is an assistant professor in history at Muhlenberg College in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And we're delighted to have her here with us today. Um, she specializes in the history of medicine, gender, and politics in the United States. Dr. Antonovich holds a PhD in history from the University of Michigan and a master's degree in history and women's studies from the University of Wyoming. She recently published an article titled White Coats, White Hoods, The Medical Politics of the Ku Klux Klan in 1920s America. And she's currently working on a book with Rutgers University Press on the history of women physicians and their political activism in the American West. She's on the editorial advisory board for the Bulletin of the History of Medicine and is executive editor emerita of Nursing Clio, an online journal that ties historical scholarship to present day issues related to gender, health, and medicine. She's taught multiple really fascinating courses um, that are relevant to us, specifically in the Department of Medicine, including history of disability in the United States, gender and Jim Crow, and snake oil, quacks, and self-help alternative medicine in the United States. She's also given a number of talks related to women in medicine, including Healing the Body Politic, Women Physicians and the Fight for Suffrage, and Women Physicians and the Politics of Reproductive Medicine in the American West. Uh, she and her work have been quoted in, in a prominent outlets such as the Chronicle of Higher Education, Slate Magazine, and the Washington Post. So it's truly an honor um, to have Dr. Antonovich here with us today. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to her. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Salas, Dr. Harmon, uh, Dr. Oldzaga, uh, Ms. Ochoa, and everyone else at Stanford Medicine uh, for inviting me uh, to be here and facilitating my visit. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, okay, so I'd actually like to begin um, my talk uh, here we go, with someone that you're probably familiar with. That's Elizabeth Blackwell. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Dr. Blackwell, I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of uh, her life story. So, she was born in 1821, um, and Blackwell was inspired to pursue a career in medicine when a friend on her deathbed confided to Blackwell that she might have received better care in the hands of a female physician. Now, at the time, there were very few medical schools in the United States uh, because most physicians trained as apprentices during this period, um, and none of these schools accepted women. Rejected everywhere she applied to, Blackwell was eventually admitted to Geneva Medical College in upstate New York. But her acceptance was a bit of a practical joke. Um, the dean and the faculty sort of unsure about what to do with Blackwell's application, 
decided to let the students vote on whether to accept her or not. So all 150 male students voted unanimously to admit her, thinking that it was kind of funny um, and thinking that she would never actually show up for classes. But as we know, she did show up, um, but her time at Geneva was quite difficult. Um, professors forced her to sit separately at lectures. They often excluded her from labs. Her classmates often played jokes on her. Um, and even the local townspeople shunned her for sort of defying her traditional gender roles. Um, and as the story goes, through her hard work and dedication, uh, Blackwell eventually earned the respect of her professors and classmates, graduating first in her class in 1849 and becoming the first woman to earn a medical degree in the United States. Now, Elizabeth Blackwell's journey to becoming the first woman physician is sort of canon in the history of medicine, right? Um, there are several monuments to her achievements, um, and I would wager that most physicians and medical students, especially those who identify as women, have heard this story several times. Um, we often think about her, write about her, and talk about her as a pioneer in history. Um, a woman alone in her fight overcomes immense obstacles to blaze a trail uh, for women. Um, and, and Blackwell is far from the only woman we consider a pioneer in the history of American medicine, right? We have a lot of these firsts. Um, for example, we have Rebecca Lee Crumpler, who becomes the first Black woman to earn a medical degree um, in 1864. We have Mary Edwards Walker, who becomes the first female U.S. Army surgeon during the Civil War. Uh, we have Anne Preston, who was the first woman to become a dean of a medical college in 1866. Uh, we have Suzanne Lafleche Picote, who was the first indigenous woman to earn a medical degree in 1899. Uh, we have Dr. Margaret Chung, who was the first Chinese American woman to become a physician in 1916. And Dr. Sarah Josephine Baker, who was the first woman physician to earn a doctorate in public health in 1917. And this is just to name a few. All of these women are indeed pioneers. And as you can see, we often feature them in children's books um, as role models to look up to, and, and rightly so. But what do we lose when we tell their stories as isolated events? What are we missing when we only focus on these few women in history who become the first to do something? In many ways, this pioneer narrative sort of oversimplifies the history of women in medicine. And, and I would argue, neglects a larger, more significant story. Um, after Blackwell earned her medical degree in 1849, a whole generation of women followed in her footsteps. Historians often point to the period between 1870 and 1920, um, as the first wave of women physicians in American history, with 1920 uh, being its zenith. These women were not um, firsts in their field, nor were they household names, but their life stories and their day-to-day -day work are actually crucial for understanding what it was like to be a woman in medicine at the turn of the century. Um, more importantly, this pioneer framework ignores how this cohort of women physicians often worked together to enact change in their communities, often collaborating on, on creating public health institutions or addressing the healthcare needs of women and children. Um, and finally, because history is more complicated than we often want to admit, this pioneer rhetoric can be problematic because it has the effect of sort of deifying these women, which can disguise the ways in which many female physicians during this period contributed to racial discrimination in, in medicine. So here's what I wanna to do today. Um, I want to present a case study from my research on women physicians in the American West, uh, specifically Denver, Colorado, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. 
By examining their private practices, their professional networks, and their public health work, we can see how ordinary women physicians practiced medicine, lived their day-to-day -day lives, and how they collaborated to advocate for institutions that filled critical gaps in the city's early public health system. Even though these women are not household names, they played a significant role in creating the health geography of the city, a landscape that is still visible today. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm gonna sort of give us a brief background of Denver. Um, so you sort of understand why women physicians migrated to the city. Um, and so we'll examine you know, their migration to the city. Um, I'm gonna take a brief moment to talk about their private practices. Um, and then women's professional networks, and then how that morphed into their public health work. Okay. So I wanna start by giving you a very, very brief background on early Denver in order to understand why women physicians played such an important role in the city's development. Um, so in the closing decades of the 19th century, Colorado, um, along with other, a couple of other different uh, states like California, uh, Colorado became a top uh, destination for health seekers all over the country, uh, mostly people suffering from tuberculosis. Um, and there was a belief at this time that the mountain air, um, and especially the elevation, could treat or even cure respiratory diseases and other ailments. Um, and Colorado's reputation as a health destination became so preeminent that between 1890 and 1920, about 40% of the new residents moved to the state for health reasons. Um, and I always find that people find this, 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 um, this statistic surprising because we often think about people moving to Colorado for gold, right? Um, but actually the majority of people who moved uh, to the state were seeking health. Um, and so in just a few short decades after its founding, the capital city of Denver, not only became the largest city in the region, it became the epicenter of what was called medical climatology, um, attracting a large number of physicians, druggists, and nurses to sort of care for this growing um, health-seeking population. And Denver's ex uh, expanding healthcare economy also attracted significant numbers of women physicians, especially after 1893 when Colorado won their suffrage right, um, women doctors wanted to practice medicine in a state where they could also vote. Um, and this is just a screenshot of uh, the, the very massive um, spreadsheet I have of been sort of collecting and, and tracking down various women physicians who practiced in Colorado um, during this time period. And so by 1900, the city had become the most popular destination for women physicians um, who migrated to the state with over 80% of women doctors opening their practices in the state capital. Um, and by 1920, the city had twice the national average of women physicians. Um, so it's quite a, 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 an important place, and a, an important site to, to study the history of women physicians. Okay, so, so what did women physicians do once they moved to the city? Although some worked at hospitals, colleges, and sanitariums, private practice was the preferred option. Now, women faced several decisions when considering private medical practice. For many newly arrived doctors in an unfamiliar city, setting up a home office was the cheapest, quickest, and most convenient option. Um, but factors beyond economics, influenced a woman's decision whether or not to open up a home office. Um, for a male physician, the home office operated as sort of a unique site in the age of industrialization, right? One that sort of combined elements of family and work. A physician could attend to his patients in his own home, and the physician's wife could balance her domestic tasks with maybe bookkeeping or nursing duties. Uh, but for the woman physician, the home office represented an additional blurring of the domestic and the professional. During this period, the home was the ultimate symbol of the American family, with the wife and mother responsible for curating domestic bliss. Um, and so home offices served as sites where women physicians could establish 
professional spaces within their own homes without neglecting their own domestic sphere. Now, this arrangement carried different ramifications for different women. For a married woman, especially one married to another physician, which was quite popular during this time, uh, working from home could be beneficial. She could pursue a career and a family. And it's possible that this arrangement also retained an important veneer of respectability. By working out of the home, a woman physician remained secure in her domestic sphere and the presence of a husband, especially if he was a doctor, lent legitimacy to her medical practice. But for single women physicians, this opening up a home office could have been a, a dicier proposition. Although she could more easily afford a home office rather than taking on the additional cost of a non-residential office, a single woman practicing medicine out of her own home carried the risk of being labeled a quack, a midwife, or even you know, the worst thing would be being labeled an abortionist, right? Um, but despite these considerations, women physicians opened home offices all over the Denver metropolitan area. And each had to weigh carefully in which neighborhood to reside. A house needed to be in a location appropriate to start a home, but it also needed to be in a place that could sustain and grow a medical practice. Um, and while many women chose to set up their home offices downtown, just on the outskirts of the central business district, many others set up home offices in one of many uh, streetcar suburbs popping up all throughout the area during this time. Um, Augusta Rothwell, for example, graduated from Gross, uh, Gross Medical College in 1900 and along with her physician husband, Edwin Rothwell, set up a private practice in their home at 3021 Lawrence Street. Located in an area just northeast of downtown known as Curtis Park, they practiced medicine together while raising two daughters and four sons. Curtis Park was home to mostly American Easterners who had migrated to the state um, but also a pretty large population of Northern European migrants. And the neighborhood reflected an unusual mix of economic difference. So you had sort of like well-to-do railroad men and businessmen who lived in these lar uh, large and lavish houses right next door to blacksmiths and bank clerks whose homes were much more modest. Now we don't know a lot about uh, their day-to-day -day life during this period. Uh, but what is evident is Augusta Rothwell was an active physician in her neighborhood, and her patients seemed to be largely women and children. Um, in 1904, for example, she reported a childhood case of typhoid fever, and over the years she presented several papers on obstetrical cases from her neighborhood practice. In contrast to Augusta Rothwell, Ida Valeria Beers never married. In 1907, Beers rented a small house by herself on 9th Avenue in Lincoln Park. Um, and Lincoln Park is located just southwest of the Central Business District. And the suburb was bordered on its western edge by several milling, brewing, and um, smelting industries. And Lincoln's Park's residents were largely European, Russian, and Mexican working class families who labored in the nearby factories. And so for over 14 years, Beers cared for the women and children of uh, this neighborhood. Like Rothwell, Beers focused her practice mainly on women and children. And a medical, uh, medical journals offer us a few clues to her work in the neighborhood. Um, in 1907, she reported to the Denver Medical Times her methods for treating neighborhood children with whooping cough, um, which was, by the way, chocolate quinine. Um, and in 1912, three of her obstetric patients appeared in case studies in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Another physician who practiced from her home, Dr. Justina Ford, had no choice in the matter. The state's only Black woman physician until her death in 1952, Ford relocated to Denver in 1902, because she believed it was a place where an African-American, quote, might fully play a fuller part in community life, unquote. Yet the medical community in Colorado denied her and other black physicians hospital privileges. 
Uh, Ford consequently set up practice in her own um, home in the Five Points area of Denver, which was the city's um, African-American neighborhood. In her modest house on Arapahoe Street, Dr. Ford opened her doors to women and children of the neighborhood. Most of her patients were African-American, uh, Mexican, Japanese, Korean, Indian, and poor white immigrants who either distrusted, could not afford, or were denied access to treatment. Um, in, ho in hospitals. To better communicate with her diverse patient population, Ford learned to speak phrases in several languages. And in later years, she used her car to visit ill men and women living in migrant camps. It was not unusual for Ford to offer her services for free, accept goods and services in lieu of money or to accept delayed payments. Um, she was also known to buy, um, occasionally buy coal or groceries for some of her patients. And so Dr. Ford, her story is typical of the lives of a number of women physicians attempting to practice medicine out of their own homes and creating neighborhood spheres of healthcare. But her practice also reveals the racist medical geography that was developing in the state. Ford, a black physician, was confined to practicing medicine in five points, while her patients, mostly from marginalized populations, were funneled to her home for many of their healthcare needs. Ford and her patients also offer insight into the diverging treatment and care options in obstetrics in the early 20th century. Between 1902 and 1952, Ford attended over 7,000 home births far after doctors began requiring their patients to deliver in hospitals. And although Ford attended to home births, often out of necessity brought by racial discrimination, she also did so as a deliberate alternative for patients who may have preferred to avoid hospitals. Now, the home office only offers us a narrow picture of women's medical practice um, in Denver. In the early decades of the 20th century, more and more physicians abandoned the home office for non-residential medical buildings. And this transition was fueled largely by two factors, um, a growing reliance on scientific medicine, which required more and bigger technology, and a greater reliance on nurses and clerical support. And women doctors could be found practicing in non-residential buildings throughout the larger metropolitan area, uh, but not all commercial buildings were created equal. Each carried varying degrees of respectability or prestige. The most desirable neighborhood for medical practice in Denver was located in the city's downtown core, um, or what's now known as the Central Business District. And they, although they occupied the same professional space as many of their male colleagues, um, within these uh, 11 city blocks, women doctors created a distinctly female medical space, clustering their offices um, and sometimes even sharing space in buildings such as the Majestic, the, Me the Metropolitan, the Mac McPhee, uh, Masonic Temple, and Nevada. And these women uh, practicing medicine in these buildings were among the most uh, well-known of Colorado's physicians, and many played larger roles in politics, social programs, and institutional work. And within this area, elite women physicians not only practiced medicine, but also held professional meetings, planned political action, and campaign, campaign for various public health legislation. The McPhee Building, for example, acted as the headquarters for the Denver Clinical Society. Founded in 1896, the DCS hoped to foster professional and political relationships among women in medicine. And the organization was actually quite successful in creating a cross community of women physicians, dentists, and um, undergraduate women interested in medicine. Um, the DCS hosted conferences um, and often hosted dinners for out of town uh, medical dignitaries. Um, and I think, you know, the organization's success was in due, it was part uh, in due, due to the fact that um, it operated as a social space for medical women, right? So it wasn't just a, you know, a, a professional space, but it was a, a professional social space. Um, for example, the DCS held, 
an annual social evening where women physicians gathered for a night of revelry and camaraderie. Um, and during these boisterous evenings, the women would enjoy a dinner together. They would exchange medical anecdotes and they would roast each other uh, with good natured toasts. Um, and as the 20th century progressed, this downtown area continued to operate as a vital space for women interested in medicine, public health, and politics. Um, by the 1910s, the Women's Medical Society, which was the successor to the DCS, held their meetings in the Majestic Building. Um, these offices were also home to the Medical Women's War Service League during World War I and served as campaign headquarters of various women physicians running for political office. Um, these women-centered medical spaces worked to strengthen women's professional networks, foster political activism, and promote collaborative medical work. Sometimes these female spaces came under attack. Um, in 1900, the Colorado Medical Journal published an editorial excoriating women physicians in general and the DCS in particular. Um, the editorial argued that women's participation in larger state societies was a quote, sorry spectacle. Um, and the editorial goes on to advise women to quote, try harder to succeed in the professional world of male physicians, unquote. Um, as you can imagine, this did not go down well. Um, there are several editorials that go back and forth. Um, and women responded to this attack in a range of ways. Um, many just canceled their subscription to the journal. Um, others wrote their own editorials justifying the existence of women-only organizations. Um, one doctor wrote an editorial um, and wrote, uh, quote, women physicians are not treated on the same footing as men, and they are therefore not given the same opportunities for professional progress as the men. Um, others tried to explain that the DCS provided an important space for women physicians to discuss their craft among other women before participating in larger medical societies, which were dominated by men. Um, Despite the annoyance of some male physicians in the city, the DCS fostered an important female medical space that nurtured community and opportunity uh, for women physicians. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, it became sort of a laboratory of collaboration that attempted to address the growing health needs of the city. The Denver Children's Hospital stands out as one of the most successful and enduring institutions created through DCS collaboration. Um, Denver at the time had several niche hospitals, but none provided healthcare exclusively to children. And in the years following the Civil War, there was a national movement for children's hospitals. Um, reformers across the country argued that the ravages of industrialization threatened the health and welfare of children living in American cities, and that hospitals dedicated to their health care were in dire need. And in Denver, as the city continued to experience rapid growth, it had several uh, public health problems, and these only intensified as the years went on. Um, city officials constantly complained that Denver suffered not only from the same urban problems of eastern cities, um, but it carried the additional burden of dealing with hundreds of juvenile health seekers, as well as an equal number of children who were orphaned by parents who had died of their illnesses. Um, by 1890, Denver's population was nearly 107,000, but it still lacked a children's hospital. So, Troubled by the large population of sick children in Denver and wanting poor youth to benefit from Colorado's famous climate, Dr. Minnie Love established the Babies, uh, the Babies Summer Hospital in 1897. Um, and this is sort of an outdoor tent hospital. It was um, intended to serve babies and toddlers of the city. Love garnered the logistical support of her DS, DCS colleagues to establish the tent hospital. She staffed the hospital with six other medical women and volunteer nurses who could attend up to 50 children under the age of five, all free of charge. 
But I mean, as you can imagine, operating an outdoor hospital proved to be a little bit difficult. Uh, physicians and nurses had to work sometimes in oppressive heat. Um, and they had to make sure that their supplies, medicines, and refrigeration received meticulous attention. Um, in 1898, with the outbreak of the Spanish-American War, the tent hospital was forced to shut down so that Denver could uh, divert its medical services to the war effort. Um, in the years following the war, Minnie Love and fellow DCS members, Dr. Eleanor Lani and Dr. Ethel Frazier, began discussing plans to establish a permanent year-round site for the hospital. So the women uh, got together, they filed for articles of incorporation and drafted a constitution for the hospital board. And included in its bylaws was a stipulation that women make up the majority of the members of the association and at least half of the physicians on staff. And so here you can see how these professional networks developed within the DCS facilitated not only institutional development, but employment opportunities uh, for women physicians. Um, so despite their lofty goals of, of building and running a children's hospital in the largest city in the Intermountain West, state and city officials refused to help fund its construction. Um, the physicians responded by organizing numerous small private fundraisers across the city. Um, so these fundraisers included um, doll bazaars, public readings, concerts, charity balls, and, and pretty much anything else they could think of to raise money. They also each pledged $100 personally for the building fund um, and even came together to make hospital bedding from donated supplies. Um, and finally, on uh, February 17th, 1910, the Children's Hospital opened its doors as a well-equipped institution with a capacity of 30 beds. Now, of course, this looks quite different uh, than you know, what it looks like now. And it, um, it changed locations a few times um, before uh, uh, it made its permanent home um, to where it is today. Um, unlike the Summer Hospital, the Denver Children's Hospital had sort of more selective admission policies. The institution refused to admission to children with incurable or contagious diseases, um, while patients with chronic diseases were not accepted unless a physician noted that treatment might be helpful. Um, the hospital did admit patients of any race, ethnicity, or income level. They came from all over Colorado, the Intermountain West, and the Greater Southwest, making the Children's Hospital a critical health resource for the entire region. And by the end of its first year, the hospital housed 291 children with roughly a third receiving free or discounted care. Now, the Denver Children's Hospital was not the only institution created by city, uh, the city's women physicians. Um, Dr. Eleanor Lani and Dr. Catherine Yant founded the Flower Mission, an organization evolved, that eventually evolved into the state's first healthcare, home healthcare agency. Um, this was headquartered at the McPhee Building, um, and the charity's original purpose was to distribute flowers, fruit, um, and clothing to sick or disabled residents of the city. Um, but after witnessing an overwhelming number of Denverites who were too debilitated to leave their homes to to sort of visit the doctor or go to the hospital, the Flower Mission soon began providing home health care. And by 1905, the Flower Mission incorporated itself and changed its name to the Visiting Nurse Association, employing um, three full-time nurses. Um, the association continued to offer flowers and food and comfort, um, but it also provided critically needed health care. So for example, um, in 1899, the organization made 1,787 visits to 145 homes. They distributed 276 garments, performed 14 operations, removed eight residents to the hospital, and attended 13 deaths. Um, and although uh, maternity cases and tuberculosis were the main um, ailments or you know conditions that women physicians and their nurses attended to, um, they cared for patients with a wide variety of illnesses, diseases, um, and other healthcare needs, as, um, as you can see here. 
So the Denver Children's Hospital and the Flower Mission are just two examples of the many institutions created through the collaborative work of women physicians in Denver at the turn of the century. Um, and so here you can see, this is a sort of a very crude map that I'm still working on um, of different institutions um, that they created by 1920. Um, and although many of these institutions closed down over the next few decades, the medical geography created by women physicians left a permanent mark on Denver's built landscape. Um, the Visiting Nurse Association and the Denver Children's Hospital continue, um, obviously, to operate as important health uh, facilities in the city. And many sanitariums, hospitals, and other facilities created by women physicians still operate as sites of care um, all over the city. Um, the longevity of these health sites is a testament to the legacy of the DCS and women physicians institutional work in the city. Now, although the DCS was incredibly successful in creating a space that fostered professional networks, acted as a barrier for male doctors who disagreed with their presence um, and served as a site of collaboration for public health work, perhaps the power of an organization like DCS is evident in who they excluded, Justina Ford. Although she built a thriving practice in Five Points, because of her race, she was isolated from the women's medical community in Denver, as well as the larger medical community of Colorado. Not only was she barred from joining DCS, the Colorado Medical Society also refused her membership until 1950, despite Ford reapplying on a yearly basis. Now, the ramifications of this exclusion are important. Ford could not obtain hospital privileges unless she was a member of the American Medical Association, but she couldn't join the AMA unless she was first a member of the DCS or uh, the, DM, the DMS. And not only did this exclusion bar Ford from access to hospitals, but it essentially excluded her from the benefits of professional networking in the DCS and in turn from participating in this institutional and public health work fostered through these relationships. So I wanna wrap up with some concluding thoughts. Um, in 1849, when Elizabeth Blackwell received her medical degree, it was probably impossible to imagine a world where women physicians shaped the medical landscape of an entire city that didn't even exist yet. Denver was founded almost 10 years later in 1858. Yet her quest to become the first female physician in the United States opened the door for a whole generation of women to follow in her footsteps. She, she is indeed a pioneer. But I think it's really important, especially as we celebrate Women's History Month, to look beyond this pioneer narrative, to see the richer, more complex and multifaceted history of women physicians in the United States. As demonstrated by my case study today, many of these women physicians worked diligently and, and sort of anonymously out of their own homes, creating localized spheres of care for women and children in the neighborhood. Other women inspired by the robust female medical space um, in the central business district collaborated with one another to address critical gaps in the healthcare infrastructure of the city, creating institutions that still exist today. And perhaps more importantly, the pioneer narrative often sort of corners us into hero worship, right? Which doesn't allow us to explore the complexity of women physicians during this period especially when we consider their complicity in perpetuating racism or other forms of discrimination, as we saw in the case of Justina Ford. Um, history is complex, right? And we have to grapple with the tough question of how to remember the accomplishments of these women while still confronting the harms they may have caused. Um, and as a historian, I would argue that moving beyond this pioneer narrative helps us to do just that. It allows us to see these women, not just as one dimensional characters in a contest over who was first, right? Rather, it encourages us to, to recognize their humanity, their everyday medical practice, their group dynamics, their successes and their failures, their broad impact, 
um, and their missed opportunities. Um, thank you. So um, I really look forward to having a conversation about this. Thank you very much. We stop sharing my screen here. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Antonovich. That was so fascinating. Um, I, I really appreciated um, all of that context that you gave. Um, and, and there's a question in the chat and then um, I've got some, some questions myself. We can just start with the question that's in the chat, um, which is whether there was a pay gap, a gender pay gap back at that time. And do we know how big it was? <laughs> um, I don't have the numbers offhand, and as you can imagine, it's actually really difficult to sort of put some of these numbers together, but it's something that I've been looking at um, for the book that I'm currently writing. Um, and definitely there was a pay gap between male physicians and women physicians, but not only that, there were pay, there were pay gaps between different women physicians, so it would really depend on um, um, between women physicians, what city you were working in, where you were working, right? So certainly someone like Ida Valeria Beers, who's working in a very working class suburb, is not making a lot of money versus someone else who's working in the central business district, um, who's working much more money, um, making much more money. I don't have the numbers with me offhand, but there are, there is, um, we do have some evidence that women physicians at the time uh, the, the especially well-off ones were claiming that they made somewhere around $3,000 a year, which was actually quite high. Uh, but that certainly was not the case for all um, women physicians. Yeah, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, I also was struck in your talk by some parallels, even though we're talking about, um, you know, 18, late 1800s and early 1900s, um, some parallels to modern day society, right? You started out talking about um, in the private practice setting that um, for married women, it was helpful to work from home. And here we are now <laughs> in the <laughs> pandemic, having a lot of conversations about working from home and, and people, not just women, uh, but all sorts of people being very reluctant to leave that setting um, and, and you know return to work. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting parallel. And then your point about hero worship also um, reminds me of some conversation at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, around calling healthcare workers heroes. And, and many of us said, please don't do that because exactly what you described, that makes us, you know, one dimensional characters. And in reality, we are, we are humans who have the, the same uh, depth and breadth of emotion as everybody else. Um, and, and, and we're not invulnerable to any of um, kind of the awfulness in the world um, in, any, in any way, we're not shielded um, differently from other people. So those are really interesting parallels to me. I wondered if you could talk um, for a little bit about the parallels between um, kind of the way the white women were gatekeeping um, other women from having access to the professional societies and how that may mirror or not what happened in the, in the movement for suffrage and how white women there um, interacted with other groups of women who we know only got the right to vote much later, um, not with the original passage of the 19th Amendment. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you. All of these things that you're saying are, are giving me such uh, food for thought. Um, but in, in, in reference to your question, it's a really good one and it's a really complex one. Um, there is, as you may or may not, and I'm sure you know, there is a lot of tension in the suffrage movement um, during this time period uh, that's centered on race, right? So, you know, again, this is why I think it's important to sort of not stick to this pioneer narrative because eventually people who you think are your heroes will probably disappoint you, right? Because they're human beings and they have their faults. Um, many women physicians were involved in the suffrage movement. Um, they were making arguments, and this is why Denver was such a popular place for them, because they could already vote right way before the 19th Amendment. But they were particularly making arguments that as professional women, um, that they, uh, their, their status as professional women was undercut if they couldn't vote, right? Um, and that having the vote would enable them to sort of fulfill their roles as physicians much more uh, broadly. Um, at the same time, most of the physicians in the American West who were involved in the suffrage movement were white women. 
Um, and unfortunately, they were making a lot of arguments that uh, were sort of uh, eugenic arguments and sort of intelligence arguments um, that were basically saying, um, there's one physician in particular that I'm thinking of who sort of argued that uh, women, white women physicians needed the vote in order to sort of to, to preserve the Anglo-Saxon home, right? So they were at the same time sort of positioning themselves as these um, important folks who um, would, um, you know, that, that were trying to break down these gender barriers, but at the same time, they were not only gatekeeping uh, women of color um, from medical profession, but were also actively trying to keep them from, from voting. So um, it's very complicated and, and kind of yucky. Yeah, thank you so much for, for giving us that context, um, you know, a lot of that is still relevant to today, right? As we talk about feminist movements and, and where they have failed, um, which is largely failing women who are not white um, in, in many different ways. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna turn now to Dr. Harmon who has a, a question about working from home. Thank you so much for that talk. I, I was curious because of the research you've done around these models where both um, uh, both physicians in a household would be working from home. Um, it, it's, it's kind of remarkable how relevant that is <laughs> right now. And were there descriptions of kind of what, what that shared work was like or what that work was like with the, the children in the home? Because it sounded like that also was happening at the same time. Um, this, is a, um, this is a challenge for many and with kind of gendered roles in our society, it's um, certainly affecting the women and um, their professional lives. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So I think it depends on, you know, the, the individual couple, right? But I think one of the best ways I've been able to get at this is sort of like, how are they doing this um, with children in the home and, you know, two, you know, two practicing physicians in the house. Um, and you might be surprised to learn that um, I feel like it is all within the working hours, right? So trying to figure out when they're actually working. Um, one of the inf pieces of information I've been able to find is that, you know, their offices will be open from like, um, I don't know, from like 10 to two or 10 to three, right? So their working hours are actually sort of really, um, narrow. And for some um, men and women, they would be open at the same time and they would largely, women physicians during this time were largely treating me, uh, uh, other women and children, right? And so the women and the children would come in to see the, the wife and, you know, the men would come in to see the men. Um, a couple of instances I've found where they just sort of switched off either days, like the husband would work on one day and the wife would work on another day, or they'd work on different hours. Um, so it's actually really interesting how creative they get with their spaces. Um, and I will add that I, I probably nobody's gonna find this surprising. I have found several instances where, you know, the woman physician, sort of takes the back seat to the male's practice, right? They're sort of more of a nurse um, than having their own practice. So, um, which again, is probably not that surprising. Sounds like lots of variability, much as we see uh, today as well in, in families <laughs> and as they try to figure out how to balance all the different needs and stressors in life. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left. So I, I see a, um, a question that I'm gonna add to. So the question is, did the Flexner report evaluate women physicians groups? Um, we know, I'll just add a little context there, which I'm not sure if this person was getting at this, but we know that the Flexner report led to the shutdown of uh, many um, institutions that served black students in, in terms of access to medical school. I don't know if there was uh, something like that for, for women and access to medical school. So we would be curious to hear your comment on that. And then I wanted to link that to the book Boys in White, um, which came out in the, I believe it was the 1950s, that was about is a sociological study of medical students. And um, even though, as you point out, there were women in medicine at that time, um, they're, they're completely uh, left out of the title of the book. And I've actually read the book, although it's been a minute, and I don't recall there being any women in the book at all. Um, and so 
<laughs> I didn't know if you have any uh, context for that and why why people um, even as late as the 1950s were erasing women um, from the, the narrative of medicine. So first the question about the Flexner report um, and then the second about the erasure of women. I love this question because I think a lot of folks who aren't familiar with the history of women in medicine are sort of surprised when they learn there were so many, I mean, relatively women physicians by 1920. And then um, the next question is often, why does it take this huge dive after 1920? And then why doesn't it come back up until the 1970s, right? Um, and the reason behind that is the Flexner report. Um, and, um, and, and that's because um, as you mentioned, they have Flexner has a whole section in there about African American medical schools, and it has this devastating effect um, on those schools. Um, and what he says, he's got also has a section on women physicians, and he's a lot more generous to women physicians. Um, you know, arguing that they need a medical space um, and that they're really important for uh, you know. Uh, obstetrics and gynecology and pediatrics, which are sort of developing specialties at the time. Um, so that's not necessarily what tanks the numbers of women physicians, but what it is, is, as you may know, the Flexner Report results in the revolution of American medicine, the way in which it's structured. So prior to the Flexner Report, women physicians or women who were medical students could get their medical degrees in various ways, right? They could go to night school. They could go part-time and take a class or two and then go work if they needed to earn money. They had a lot more flexibility in the ways in which they could become physicians. But of course, what the Flexner Report does is it, um, it unifies medical education, it ties it to university, it requires you to have a bachelor's degree, it requires you to do, um, you know, this, this very long, uh, you know, years and years of medical education, and it makes medical education, because it closes down a lot of other schools, more competitive, and medical schools then feel like they need to give those positions to men. Um, and so all of those factors um, combine to make it really difficult for women physicians to do that balancing of home and, you know, and medical school. Um, and it makes it very difficult to, um, to, to, for women to go to medical school and in essence erases women from medicine for a long time, even though we continue to have women physicians throughout the 20th century, not in numbers like we had in the 1920s, until the 1970s. So even though he was more generous, the result of the Flexner Report was really devastating for women physicians. Yeah, and that explains maybe why by the 1950s when they're writing um, Boys in White, uh, they, they write about boys. Yep. <laughs> The women yep. are, have have kind of left by then. Yeah. Um, wow. That's that's so interesting, and and you. We, I think we've all learned so much today from your presentation. Um, there are a number of comments in the chat thanking you and and commenting on how wonderful this talk was. Um, and as a woman physician, I'm I'm so grateful to you for doing this work. Um, and trying to help us understand our past, which is the only way that we can really move forward. Um, thank you all for being here. And with that, uh, I know we're a couple minutes over, so, so we'll go ahead and end uh, today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Antonovich. Um, thanks to everyone else for being here and everyone have a lovely day.